I, my name is Logan Larson. I am the Print Expo moderator for this session. Um, I'm here to welcome Martin and um, moderate questions and any other issues that might arise. Um, yeah, do you wanna introduce yourself, Martin? Hi, I'm, I'm Martin Mazzora. Um, joining you guys here from Brooklyn, New York today. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you everyone that's put this together. Thank you, Logan, Kathy, Paloma, and all the people that have worked really hard on this. Emmy, I'm, I'm stoked to get this over with. I mean, for today. <laughs> Perfect. Well, so we're going to start off by um, watching this video that Martin has made, and then we'll go into a Q&A session after. So that, anything else? I think we're- Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. And please let me know if the audio or anything is kind of messed up. Hi, I'm Martin Mazzora. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm an artist living and working in Brooklyn, New York. My work combines my hand carved woodcuts with my antique collection of wood and letterpress type. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you today how I came to terms with making my artwork during the pandemic when I didn't have access to the tools and materials that I traditionally use to make my woodcut and letterpress prints. In this presentation, I'm going to show through a series of steps and missteps how I was able to adapt Lego blocks into my process by first sharing with you how I worked out a scalable model here at home and then how I was able to adapt this process and materials into a larger format project that I was eventually able to print on my letterpress in Connecticut. Ultimately, I look forward to being able to share with you how I use this process and these unconventional materials to stamp out a multicolored Coney Island sideshow themed series of prints in a very short window from my studio in Connecticut over the summer. Now, to give you a little bit of background information about myself, I've been making woodcut prints pretty much the same way for over 20 years. I start each one out by hand drawing and then carving these designs in MDF boards using hand tools. These carvings are finished when I've removed all of the material from the boards that I do not want to print. I combine these finished carvings with my collection of movable wood and metal type and then secure them in my printing press. Then, I roll them up with my own limited edition special formula of Speedball Ink Cannonball Black. And when they're good and inky, I print these compositions on fabric or paper using one of my Vandercook printing presses. At least this is how I had done up until last spring, when this glamorous lifestyle was put on hold and I had to come to terms with how I would make stuff if I didn't have access to all the special tools and equipment. Preparing for this presentation had me reflecting on the make and place experience from the beginning of the pandemic. This is a view of my home office print shop in Brooklyn. It's a bit smaller than 8 by 10 feet. While hanging out in here last spring, I came across the process of printing Legos like woodcuts while looking for a way to share the experience of working with movable letterpress type with students that could not access a print shop or consumable materials due to the COVID-19 restrictions and the pivot to online learning. One of the things that I knew to be true from working with the limitations of movable type is that a collection of modules that are designed to be used interchangeably have innumerable creative possibilities. It was my thought that if students could not access these elaborate collections of antique letterpress equipment, they could, for a small cost, buy some select Legos and have a relatable experience, one with familiar assets, rules, patterns, structures, and workflows. To see if this was true, I decided to try making some prints with Legos like I would if I was using movable type. So, between Zoom classes and spells of impending doom, I ordered some Legos to try out my hypothesis. It took about four weeks for the Legos to arrive. I thoughtfully went to work making stuff with them immediately. These patterns were the first things that I made. I worked with the known probability stratagem to hand print a number of these unique variations by layering three Lego compositions, each inked and printed in a different primary color. There were a ton of rich possibilities in just working with the Legos. 
but the results begin to look a bit homogenous to me. So I tried building up a few layers of printed tile compositions to eventually print with a woodcut that I brought home before lockdown. I pretty much guessed where the colors would overlap and where the Lego composition would print in relationship to the woodcut. This particular experiment was encouraging, and my imagination drifted from my earlier academic interests. I pondered the possibilities of using Legos in combination with my woodcuts on a more ambitious scale. Like using this process to colorize a whole series of woodcuts, one that I had previously carved and recklessly promised to the Coney Island USA Museum gift shop. If it was going to happen, I needed to figure out a better system than the one that I had for hand printing them. I was going to have to get mathematical. When the Legos eventually arrived, I still didn't have access to my studio, but I knew ideally I wanted to print my Lego mats on my letterpress when I did, so I glued them onto 3 quarter inch pieces of plywood. I figured with a tile in place I could measure and find the difference to see how much paper backing was needed to reach type high. Now that I had these mats and tiles in front of me, I could see just how big they were and how they related to the size of the woodcut designs I was going to pair them with. I counted out how many dots across and how many dots high the Lego mats are, around 48 dots in this case. Then I commandeered a pad of graph paper my daughter had for an advanced math class that I could never understand and determined how large a 48 dot by 48 dot square would translate into inches on this graph paper. I used this measure and converted grid units into inches. I then used my home computer to size and print out my woodcut images. Using a light box, I overlaid the printout with the sheets of graph paper, then used colored pencils and markers, also my daughter's, to color the code the corresponding dots in the graph paper grid to plan each of the three color separations that would go on the three different Lego mats. The color coded graph paper grid served as maps to show me where to put the Lego tiles on the mats. Using the graph paper guides to apply the tiles to the Lego mats was like a game of solitaire battleship. I used the square tiles to create spot colors I used these round circle tiles to create a kind of half tone. I tried using corresponding color tiles to indicate the color the matrix would be, but I quickly found that I didn't have enough of any one particular color to do this successfully. If you'll notice, I also added smaller single dot red squares and pink triangle quarter rounds to create a bit more detail in all of the plates. At the end of June, I finally got to my studio in Connecticut with all of my graph paper plans. After assembling the first few prints, I could see that I would have to rethink my process. I found I could not rely on my graph paper mats. They got me close, but I needed to find a way to fine tune the tile arrangements and inks so that the final prints turned out the way that I had been imagining for the past two months. I had to come up with a proofing strategy that allowed me to see where the tiles were going to print underneath the woodcut images. I needed something that worked like the transparent graph paper, only I didn't have 18 by 24 sheets of tracing paper. What I came up with was to print ghosts of the woodcuts and then print the colors from the Legos on top of these transparent impressions. In this way, I was able to see if the tiles were in the right locations, or if they needed to be adjusted. There was a lot of adjusting. The graph paper planning was important, as it minimized this aspect of the process. Winging it would have taken even more time and materials. Besides, picking those tiles off there is murder on your fingernails. I ended up using a butter knife for most of it. I had to go from mat to mat, printing, moving, and readjusting the tiles. Still, some tiles hung out of registration, or didn't correspond to the drawing, or colors just didn't overlap right. Eventually, assembling them into the arrangements that I felt reflected my vision. 
I was stoked, but there was a problem. I only had enough mats, tiles, and drying rack space to assemble one print at a time. My New Yorker brain started scheming how I was going to save some time somewhere in this process. How was I going to make this process more efficient? I started by adjusting the three colors I was going to use. I figured I'd save some time by utilizing the same red, yellow, and blue inks throughout this series, and by modifying them to better utilize overprinting to get more colors. If the three colors were always the same, I wouldn't have to stop and mix inks for every print. I would be able to predict what the secondary and tertiary colors would be, and I'd maintain more color consistency across the suite of prints. Now I just needed the right set of colors. This was my color inspiration. For those of you that don't know this magical stuff, it's called Crunch Coat, spelled with a K for extra craziness. To achieve this party palette, I mixed the process cyan, magenta, and yellow inks I started with so that the blue was substantially lighter and greener than true cyan, the red was a light shade of fluorescent pink rather than magenta, and the yellow was not process yellow, but a pale yellow orange. Now that I had had my ice cream, I was able to grill and chill. I went back and reworked the graph paper guides to incorporate more overprinting of colors. I realized that I had found a system that allowed me to be present and creative. I used the proofing process and my newfound mindfulness to make the layouts even more complex. Each image in the series started building on the things I was learning in the one before. The later prints started reflecting this accumulated knowledge. I was stoked how the transparency of all three colors allowed for a greater color variety. The primary colors now had a strong graphic relationship with the overlapping colors, and I was excited to see the colors and how they would look with the black key line woodcuts on top of them. This was my view while printing all of the wood type. I was able to save some time while addition printing because I was able to print the black woodcut key line as well as the letterpress copy on several editions a day without having to clean the press. To finish all six prints in this series took about four or five weeks of being in the studio every day. I got in pretty good rhythm of proofing the Lego mats for a couple of days, then addition printing, and while these prints were drying, proofing the Lego mats again. Now that I've shown you how I made these prints, I would like to share a bit about my inspiration and motivation behind choosing these woodcut images at this particular time. You should know that from the first summer I spent in New York City until now, I've been in love. And I'm not afraid to say it. Yep, love. I'm in love with Coney Island. I love the beach, boardwalk, rides, food, people, and the history. My family and I have been going to hot dog eating contests, parades, concerts, baseball games, car shows, roller derby bouts, birthday and Father's Day parties. In the past 25 some odd years, we've gone from parade goers to poster designers and judges for the world famous mermaid parade. From wandering the boardwalks just like everybody else to pour in the beers and be an employee of the month at Ruby's. You could say it's done strange things to us, but we still love it. One of our favorite places on Coney Island is this place. This building is the current home of a bar, a museum, a performance space, an art gallery, a gift shop, and a shooting gallery. But listen, it's so much more. It is the home of Coney Island USA, a non-for-profit that hosts, in addition to a ton of oddball arts programming, the world-famous Mermaid Parade, Burlesque at the Beach, the Congress of Curious People, the Coney Island Film Festival, and Sideshow at the Seashore. 
One of America's last true freak shows, Sideshow at the Seashore has a revolving cast of colorful performers that each add a creative twist to the time-honored, amazing feats of physical showmanship. Each of the prints in my series pays tribute to one of these particular working acts or archetypes. In each case, I've taken the liberty to create my own stage persona. For example, this is Sword Swallower Heather Holiday. And this is my print of Sword Swallower Vinacaba Vendetta. Each character has accompanying text that is also authored by me and references the language of the Ballyhoo, the banter one would use to draw a crowd and entice them into the show. My captions are meant to evoke the spirit of this sensational carnivalesque advertising, like Favi Foco, the human blowtorch. This poster guarantees that she'll set your world on fire. Filled with onomatopoeias, alliterations, and obtuse references, the snake charmer, with her sibilating and slithering, is something special to see. Most of these are just corny jokes, like Flexi Felix with his tagline that states, Behold, feats of hyperelasticity and fantastic flexibility so mind-warping it seems not, yes, not with a K, possible. I tried to make some of these a little bit more multi-layered. For example, Maslow's blockhead refers to theories of cognitive bias by associating a particular act with a common slur for conservative rigidity. And some of these references are reaching out to current events, like mansplaining PhD professor know-it-all. He can read your mind. He can tell you what to do with your money, but he's guaranteed to offend everybody. Hey again. So now that you met my friends that I made during quarantine, I'd like to let you in on what I'm going to do with these additions. It's my intention to give 50% of the proceeds to the sales of these prints to Coney Island, USA. And because you sat through this whole presentation, I would like to offer you a special promo code that'll get you 20% off at martmazora.net. Can't tell you how happy it makes me to help you help me help Coney Island and support their invaluable arts programming. That's why if you go over to martmazora.net and enter in the promo code of Ballyhoo, you're going to get 20% off of your purchase and feel 100% like you did the right thing. But don't delay. Act today. These beauties ain't going to last because they're going fast. So you need to slip on over to martmazora.net and pick out a few of these beautiful 18 by 24 inch color woodcut letterpress prints. Put them in your cart and click, click, click that purchase button and drop in Ballyhoo, all caps, B-A-L-L-Y-H-O-O -O, in the promo code, and you're going to get 20% off of your purchase. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope to see you all again real soon. Amazing. Well, wow. never gets old. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say if anyone has questions, you can drop them in the Q&A um, button at the bottom of the screen and I can pose them to Martin. Um, and I will just start a conversation with you. So this came about because of COVID and COVID-19 pandemic, but um, how did your students react to kind of doing it? Did you have the opportunity to pose it to them or? I, I feel like um, this was in the plenary stage, you know, um, as we were pivoting to online and coming up with projects for this fall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was not something that I ended up instituting as part of that in the, in the fall. Yeah. So it's yet to been tested on the more nimble minds um, that are out there. It'll be far more creative than I am with it. Yeah. 
Well, it's so interesting to see that CMYK process kind of take effect um, in the prints and how you built up from a common um, like few colors. Yeah, it was all about that ice cream, dude. If that if 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 I hadn't had that um, one experience, I don't think I could have got this. Um, right, there's questions. Yeah. So um, someone asked, can they be hand printed or printed on an etching press? Um, they can be hand printed. And I imagine that if you were very careful about adjusting the pressure, you could you could print them on the etching press as well. Some of those bigger dots, were those still Legos or? Yeah. Um, when you saw the image of it that was on, it was composed on the uh, letterpress. Mm -hmm. Those are actually type high pieces of uh, wood ornament. They're round wood ornaments that are about, you know, an inch to uh, an inch and three quarters in diameter. Mm -hmm. But they were in the spirit of those big goofy dots. Yeah. Um. What did everyone, what did the organization and the performers think of the work? Were they stunned? Um. You know, the uh, organization is very supportive and they've been very supportive of um, this project. And it was one of the reasons that I was inspired to, to actually finish this was because I uh, promised them mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that it, you know, I, I had said that I would do this and I've gotten some, you know, really positive feedback from the, um, the people that are there that are working there. Um, Lori Lieber provided me with the photographs. Um, of Coney Island and that are promotional photographs and of the space that's there and of the mermaid parade and, and some, some of the photographs were my own from, you know, the hot dog eating contests and stuff like that. But yeah, I've had a lot of support from them. Yeah. We have some questions about, so Frankie says, were the Legos actually used on the press? Um, and if so, where did you find the Legos to suit the size for 18 by 24? Um, yeah, um, so the, you know, you have to do some, some scrounging on the, on the uh, Lego website to find that stuff. Um, they, have a, they have a particular element on there called pick a brick. Um, I remember that from my, from my Lego days, yeah. Okay, cool, so you're a Lego maniac. <laughs> back in the day, back in the day. I remember back in the day. Door. Yeah. The um, that's where you find it. You did? Nice. Yeah. Back so, in the day. Yeah. And I remember they had the option to like, they used to have a online system that you could like make the thing that you wanted to make in their Lego, like create site. Damn. And then you could order everything and make it. Yourself. I'll order everything after you did it, after yeah. you put it together. Wow. But, yeah, that's 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 how I got it, and you have to do some searching around to 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 do it, but it it makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking, was it difficult to ink up the Lego blocks? Um, no, I no. mean you get a lot of artifacting if you're not very careful. Mm -hmm. um, you get a, the little dots will pick up and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of charm that comes from hand printing them, mm -hmm. um, and they, as you can see behind me. They don't necessarily always print really full because there's a cavity behind them. They're hollow behind them. And so it doesn't necessarily always meet the uh, or kiss the paper. Also that the paper that I was using was rag paper, which absorbed a lot of it more easily. Mm -hmm. um, the proofs and stuff like that I just did on uh, drawing paper, you know, yeah. so it just depends on the substrate, but it, it, they ink up okay. Yeah. And they survived the pressure. Was there any change? Over yeah, time? no, I mean, they, for whatever, you know, the, for the letterpress heads out there, I mean, that, that kiss of the, of the, of the paper to, to form is, is, uh, you know, you can adjust that with sheets of paper and stuff like that. And I found that, you know, it, it, what really destroys them is tearing them off there mm. because, you know, you're trying to, I was trying to get all this done in, in a short amount of time. So I'm like flailing at the yeah. <laughs> things like clawing at them, trying to get them off. And you, you have to spend a lot of time putting them on and off. But that was part of the mindfulness of this whole thing was to be able to be present in that moment and have that task that was familiar 
I mean, you know, you were talking about your experience with Legos, everybody, not everybody, but that's, it's like a, sometimes it's like a common source point for people. Right. So you, you could, you could enter into it with that and you could be present in that way and just, and work on it in that way. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, Jenny asked, is it, it seems like the Lego technique loosened up your way of working. Do you think you'll bring that back to your more traditional and perfect coloring, color layering, or do you think you'll be a, 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 a neurotic printmaker still? Yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> um, no, I, I do think that there was, there was a lot more of um, that ability to just kind of be there, be present in that moment. And I think that that's something that this whole experience has, has really, um, you know, changed for me. So yet to be seen, but let's hope so, you know. Oh. Well, someone, Emerson asked a similar question. If you're interested in continuing to explore this process and how you would modify it slash use it in the future. I feel like you, you came to modify it a lot when you finally got back into the studio, but is there things that you want to like continue trying out with it or? I think that, you know, it, I think that being able to, to develop and work with it a little bit more fluidly would be nice, you know. Um, you know, people have made suggestions about um, putting textures on the the tiles and and, and doing stuff like that. I mean, you know, um, I have I, I, the way that I work is I usually draft and carve and then respond to it. You mm -hmm. know, and so um, it's yet to be seen. You know, I think that it I, it filled the niche at a particular point in time. You know. And I, uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I mean, it's why I'm excited about sharing about it. I would, I would really like to see what somebody else does with it too. I mean, um, I know that there are people out there that have done this, you know, in past workshops and, and have used it. And so, you know, I'm excited to just kind of add to that, mm -hmm. but I have no plans to, no great thoughts on that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> just a Lego printer. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Um, there's a question. Do you think if you glued flat bottoms to a stiff substrate that it would be, that it would achieve a similar effect? Yeah, dude, glue some buttons on something. I, I'm sure they, you, you has to be, it would have to be for a letterpress, it would all have to be unit dimensionally. It would all have to be the same thickness. That was the one thing that, um, that, you know, even with this commercial manufacturing of something that really the tolerance for that, um, I'm sure is small, but there's, irregularities between that stuff buttons would all have to be the same size button to work out letterpress but if you want to hand print that yeah glue some buttons sounds awesome yeah there's another question um could you make any color of the rainbow by can, combining the original three in different ways um, um only the uh, subtle variations within the tertiary colors you're going to get you know you're going to get uh, across the range, you're going to get the secondary colors and, and one tertiary color. Mm -hmm. um, but like, obviously, if they misprint, there's like some tonal variation inside there. But yeah, all the colors of the rainbow all the time. Yeah. Um, well, that's all the questions that I'm seeing. If anyone has any last ones, um, try to get them in, but we're running up against time. Do you have anything else you want to add, Martin? No, I just want to thank everybody. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate your time. I thank, appreciate you um, doing this. I'm, I'm really happy uh, to be here. And I appreciate all of you taking the time to, to watch this with me and, and, and to come out. So, and I hope everybody takes care. Um, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much.